Well, good morning and welcome to Kingston West Free Methodist Church on this uh, Sunday, September the 12th. And it's good to have you join us uh, through uh, in your home as you're watching this. Um, just a few announcements for you as we begin. Of course, we're into September. A few things coming up that uh, need you to take note of. Uh, prayer meeting, of course, continues on Thursdays at 1.30. Um, and then also the uh, Kingston Pregnancy Care Center, their Change for Life campaign or Sometimes we refer to it as the baby bottle campaign. It begins on October the 3rd, and it'll run through until October 31st. And uh, the executive director uh, from the KPCC, Elizabeth, will be uh, at Kingston West on Sunday, October 3rd, uh, to kick off the campaign for us here. And so we look forward to having her here to share, and baby bottles will be available if you want to contribute that way by putting your change in there. And uh, so a great ministry, great opportunity to be involved in that capacity. The other thing coming up that I want to make you aware of is Tear Fund Sunday. Uh, this is, we, is an annual uh, Sunday event that we uh, we hear a little bit about what relief efforts are taking place around the world through Tear Fund. And it's also a special Sunday to give to this ministry who is often and very much on the ground when uh, natural disasters happen, as well as many other programs that they are uh, running around the world to help people uh, who are in need and need a help up. Um, and so that will be taking place here at Kingston West on Sunday, October 17th. So Sunday, October 17th will be Tear Fund Sunday. So again, we look forward to that. That's all the announcements I have. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 18, and it's verses 1 to 3. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for this uh, opportunity to worship you uh, together um, and again uh, through the internet. And Lord, I just pray that as we take this opportunity to open up your word, uh, to sing uh, songs to you, to praise your name, that Lord, you will meet with us, you will encourage your people and strengthen them and meet them where they're at. For we ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Our scripture reading for today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 27. Unity and diversity in the body. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given one Spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of family, or of many, sorry. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, uh, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would, it would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker and indispensable, and the parts that, are, that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. May the Lord speak to this, his word, and uh, let's just take a moment together now to pray. Gracious Father, again, we are thankful um, we are thankful for your word that speaks into our hearts and our lives. We are thank you for the opportunity that we have to, uh, to worship you, to freely uh, gather, uh, even through these means, that we can gather and worship you and know that you are present with us, and we are so grateful for that. We are grateful for your faithfulness to each and every one of us. And we thank you that you are attentive, that, that Lord, you um, are always at work caring for us, watching over us, leading us and guiding us, that you desire so much for us as your people. And we are so grateful. And Lord, as we think of that, of your faithfulness to us, Lord, I know that uh, many times, be it in my own journey or other people's journeys as I've spoken with them, sometimes we forget to pause and say thank you, Lord, to praise you for that faithfulness. And Lord, out of gratitude, worship you, and out of gratitude, serve you in the places where you've planted us. So, Lord, you've created us all different, and you use us to accomplish your mission together as the body of Christ. So, Lord, we just pause today and we say, Lord, speak into our lives. Lead us in the ways that you desire to use us for your glory and honor. Pray for the needs represented as well, and pray that you would be at work meeting those needs, again, according to your will, and, and, uh, and Lord, that through them you will um, bring glory and honor to your name. 
So Lord, as we open up your word, may you just speak into our hearts and into our lives, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Although I would uh, never put a bumper sticker on my car, I like reading them in stores and truck stops because there are some pretty funny ones out there. In relation to the topic of the message today, here are a few that I have seen, and, and probably you've seen some of them too. You know, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. Or, I'm in no hurry, I'm on my way to work. Or, Hard work never killed anyone, but why take the chance? <clears throat> or, I didn't retire, I surrendered. And you know, we giggle a little when we hear these, but <clears throat> my question is, <clears throat> when it comes to your job, have you ever felt that way? For those of you who are retired, did you feel this way before retirement? Or maybe, you find this to be true in retirement because you've never been this busy before. Surveys would indicate that this is how most people feel about their job. Experts say that 7 out of 10 people are dissatisfied with their job and they dread going to work. Someone once asked a man, how long does it take you to get to work in the morning? He said, usually I get to work about a half hour after I clock in. You know, this type of attitude towards work is unfortunate because over the course of a lifetime, most people will spend 40% of their time on the job. It seems crazy to invest so much of your life doing something that you don't enjoy. To further the problem, many people feel trapped in their job and don't see any way out. Well, this is the third week in our series called The Business of Living. Working is a big part of our life, and the Bible has something to say about managing your career. When we talk to, about this topic, our minds automatically think about what we do to earn money. These principles certainly apply to this reality. However, don't tune me out if you're retired or a homemaker or a student, because, you know, I think you will find 
the principles that I'm sharing can be used really in all areas of our work life. Even when you're retired, there's always work to be done. And for the home executive, well, your workday never ends. For the student, these principles can be applied to your studies. Whether you love what you do or hate it, the Bible has a great deal to say about how your attitude can improve your work life. Have you ever been to a party or a family outing or even on vacation where you couldn't settle down and enjoy it because you couldn't leave behind the worries and the stresses of work? You know, I think it's happened to everyone at one time or another. However, there are times when we need to assess where we're going in our career and confirm that we're on the right track. Even in retirement, it's good to ask ourselves, am I on the right track? Am I doing what I should be doing? And today we're going to uh, look at three questions that you can ask yourself when it comes to your job. If you can answer yes to all three, then you're on the right track. If not, you may want to rethink some things about this extremely important area of your life. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 3, verses 12 and 13, I know there's nothing better for men than to be happy and to do good while they live, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. Here are the three questions you can ask yourself about your job. Number one, does this job provide enough to meet my needs? Notice the last word here, needs. We live in a society where we are bombarded with advertisements trying to tell us what we need. But truthfully, a lot of what we think we need, we can do without. You know, I think if I did a quick survey of all of us here asking, would a little more money in your paycheck be helpful? I would most likely get a positive response to that. But I want us to try to put the wants aside for a few moments and focus on our needs and ask, does my source of income meet my needs? For some of you, you would say it meets more than my needs. Others would say we're barely scraping through, and some would say it doesn't even come close. What I'm trying to say here is that if your job is meeting your needs, if you can answer yes to that question, then salary should never be a primary factor in considering a job. You have to earn enough to meet your obligations, support your family, put food on the table, a roof over your head, and so on. Beyond that, if you choose a career or a particular job based solely, solely on the salary package, you are quite possibly setting yourself up for misery. I read about a pastor who was looking for a full-time position primarily in youth ministry. He narrowed his search down to two offers, one with an adequate salary and one with a salary that was at that time more money than he had ever earned in his life before. The adequate church was in many ways ideal. It was an opportunity to work in a strong church with a dynamic youth program and a gifted pastor who was committed to growth. The other church was an opportunity to make a good salary and live in a big parsonage. He said he prayed about his decision, but not nearly enough. He took the job with the best salary. And after moving to the new church, he found out there was a reason why they offered such an attractive salary. No one could work in that environment. The leadership thrived on tension. In the previous 10 years, they had been through a series of associate pastors, music directors, and youth ministers. None had lasted more than a year. And he was the third youth minister to be hired in less than 12 months. He said, that should have been a red flag, but I was too distracted by financial considerations. And as a result, my ministry suffered, my family suffered, and I suffered. When it comes to finances, there's really only one question that matters. Does this job pay enough to enable me to meet my obligations? Solomon said that it is the gift of God if a person's work provides him or her with enough to eat and drink, i.e. to 
meet their physical needs. If it does, then it passes the test. The next two questions, however, are much more important. Secondly, you need to ask yourself, does this job give me the opportunity to do good? Solomon said, verse 12, I know that there is nothing better for men than to be happy and do good while they live. Does your job or what you are focusing on in your retirement or in your studies make it possible for you to do good for others? If you're working in an environment that requires you to oppress people, to be dishonest or to take advantage of others, then I would suggest that, that uh, you either need to change jobs or change the way you do your job. Your job must provide a means for you to do good for others. This can happen really in a variety of ways. Some people have jobs that are service oriented and uh, by doing their job, they directly benefit others. Other people have jobs that are not necessarily service oriented, but they, they have jobs or skills that make it possible to help others or to give financially and to participate in serving others, be it through the church or other areas of ministry. Maybe changing the world isn't built into your job description, but you can use that job to give you leverage to minister in other areas. A biblical example of this is the Apostle Paul. His calling was to be an apostle. Periodically, his vocation was to be a tent maker. He made tents in order to help finance his ministry. You know, I've known a few people over the years who worked to support the ministry that God had called them to. I knew one gentleman in the Brantford Free Methodist Church, and he was a carpenter by trade, and he would work hard and he would earn all the money he could for eight to nine months out of the year. And the rest of the time, he took his family and lived in various mission districts, sharing the good news of the gospel in a number of different countries. Another one was a man who owned a very successful Canadian tire franchise in Saskatoon, but that was just his source of income. Which he, was, which he used for years to help mission work in Haiti. There's also, of course, Tom and Cheryl Martin from Napanee that many people around here know, who in their retirement, they are setting up missions in Uganda and other countries. And people faithfully give to their mission work where 100% of that that they give goes to the various projects. Tom and Cheryl pay their own way out of their own funds whenever they're traveling. So make sure that your job gives you the chance to do good. Even if your job seems to be mundane, you still have the opportunity to minister to those you work with, offering them encouragement and being an example of Christ. Ask yourself, does my job give me the opportunity to do good? How can I use it to help others? Does it mean I can give more to God's work? Does it give me more time to volunteer? Does it give me the chance to minister to the people that I work with? Third question is also important, and it is, does this job give me a sense of fulfillment? Solomon said, verse 13, that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all his toil. This is the gift of God. If you don't receive satisfaction from doing your job, a sense that you are fulfilling your life's purpose, then maybe the job you're doing now is not all that God has in mind for you to do with your life. Of course, every job has certain aspects to, uh, to it that make it difficult. Part of your job may be tedious or frustrating or stressful or demanding or even boring. But the question is, overall, does this job give you a sense that you're doing what you were created to do? God wants you to find fulfillment in your work. This is his gift. Work is not a punishment, it's a blessing. Your job can be more than just hours of misery that you endure to pay the bills. It can give you a sense of fulfillment and purpose. For me, I worked a few jobs over the years. I've farmed, I've been in retail sales, I've pumped gas, I've designed playground equipment, being a security guard, and more. While I enjoyed all the jobs I did, I always felt like there was more in store for me. 
when I gave my life to Jesus at the age of 18, the thoughts that God had a purpose for me began to take root. Life continued to happen. I met Bev. We got married. We had two uh, great children. During that time, we lived uh, and I worked on a dairy farm, an apple orchard farm. Uh, we have a a lot of and uh, when you're milking the cows, you got a lot of time sometimes to think. Um, and uh, driving the tractor gives you time to think, and pruning the trees gives you time to think, and all the various jobs that there are on a farm. And although I loved farming, except I hated rock picking, but I loved farming, I found satisfaction in my toil, and I continued to feel that there was still something more. I then began to sense the call of God to go into full-time ministry, which scared me to death. But yet over time, we were obedient. I remember when we were asking the questions, uh, the big one being, uh, God, how do I know 100% for sure that you are calling me to full-time ministry? We had a very wise pastor who said to us, when I asked him that question, you may never be 100% sure, but you need to step forward trusting God to show you the way. Well, here we are 30 years later. The advice that this pastor gave us continues to be true. There are still days I ask, Lord, did, I, did you really call me to be a pastor? That question usually comes after a very difficult week. But we continue to step forward trusting that God will continue to show us the way and he's been faithful. Overall, I do find satisfaction in my toil, even though there are days when I'm frustrated, discouraged, and stressed. But you know, we all have days like that. Solomon is giving us a measuring rod in this text, and it's something we need to pull out and examine from time to time. You know that this principle also applies to your work in the church. You know, I see it over and over again, people who step up to the plate and do jobs based, uh, not based on their gifts, but based on the fact that no one else will do it. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, which I just read a few minutes ago, all about spiritual gifts and how God has gifted all of us as his body to accomplish his purposes. Are you serving in the church in an area in which God has gifted you? Just like your job, if you're not finding fulfillment in your service in the church, then maybe you, you're not serving where God has gifted you and called you to serve. Some people might say, but pastor, if I don't do it, even though I hate it, who else will? And as hard as it is to accept, it could be one of two things. It could be that God is calling someone else to do it, and they're not listening. Or it could be that God wants the ministry to cease, even for a period of time. You see, Solomon is saying that as you work, as you serve, God wants to give you a gift. He wants you to feel a deep sense of satisfaction in all that you do. And if you're not finding that, then maybe you need to consider a change. As you look at your job, as you look at the areas in which you serve in the church, ask yourself, is this my passion? Does this fit into what I feel God has gifted me and called me to do? It's far more rewarding to spend your life doing something you love, something you find fulfilling, something that enables you to do good for others, something that enables you to glorify God. Since we spend 40% of our lives at work, as much as 150,000 hours in the average lifetime, it's crucial that we find the right job and do what God's called us to do. Sometimes the temptation is to base this decision solely on financial matters. Though this is important, it's not all that there is to it. There is more to it than that. Does the job give you a chance to do good? Does the job give you a sense of fulfillment? If you're among the 70% who don't like their current job, then one of two things has to change. Either you have, have to change your job or change the way you do your job. God wants to give you a job that you can love. 
loving your job may be a matter of asking yourself these questions, uh, making a list of all that's good about it, and changing your attitude toward your work. Or it may be a matter of changing career uh, direction entirely. It's a decision that you don't have to make on your own. God will guide you every step of the way. As you consider these things, here's a final reminder. Whether you love your job or whether you are in the process of learning to love your job, it's crucial to remember that we don't work for ourselves or for any company or organization. We work for God and we should do our jobs for him. Paul said, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. Not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. That's in Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Let us pray. Gracious Father, thank you for this very practical, very down-to-earth teaching that we find uh, in your word. Thank you for Solomon, who, uh, again, the wisest person to walk this earth, and and uh, such wisdom that was written down and shared for us. And and so we, th- as we think of our jobs, as we think of what we do, whether it be um, in our workplaces, be it uh, when we're retired, be it serving in the church, wherever it is we're at, Lord, uh, just um, our desire is that you use us. And if there's work that needs to be done, if change needs to happen, um, Lord, just assure us that you are with us and on the journey together. And maybe there's change that just needs to take place in our attitude towards our work and what we do. So work in our hearts and in our lives. May we always keep our eyes fixed upon you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. I pray. Amen. Let us receive this benediction as we go today. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Have a wonderful week.